first couple lectures. Um, if you don't grasp these first couple lectures, it'll be hard. I, I think you'll just go back to your default mode, which will be, here's the way I heard the good news, and this is the way I'm going to say it. And you, you might say, that's the way I'm going to say it. I'm just going to push you a little bit to go. Maybe you can say it a little differently. So uh, we're going to talk about the good news. Um, let me uh, grab, grab a hand. And uh, let me just say a little prayer as we start. All right? Yeah, Michael, grab a hand there. Yeah, I know. Look at you, buddy. Um, Lord, you know, in, in the midst of college and academics and all of that, it's easy to lose sight of what matters. And that would be that somehow we would learn more with our heart than with our, with our head or our mind. Sometimes we get so mind-oriented and grade-oriented. I pray tonight that uh, we would listen with our heart, that your spirit would be here, that we could learn, uh, I think, the bigger truth of what you meant by the good news, and that uh, somehow this class would uh, love each other, listen to each other, um, disagree. I pray we disagree because this is the world we live in. We have to learn to disagree well with each other and still love each other. And I pray, Lord, that you would continue to work on us as we have some of us step into leadership and some of us still wondering, Lord, are you calling us to lead somehow, some way? Uh, be with us tonight and be with our small groups. In the name of our prayer. Amen. Probably uh, considered maybe Jesus' first uh, announcement, uh, maybe the earliest announcement that he made uh, after 30 something years of silence. We finally, he breaks onto the scene in Mark uh, chapter 1, I think, with these words The time has come, Jesus said, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. And the good news, the word in Greek is euangelion. It was actually a term that uh, runners who were like, they didn't have like cell phones back in the day. They'd have runners who would watch wars when like cities were being sieged or whatever. And they would watch these things. And the, 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 if you saw the runner coming up over the hill going, euangelion, it means like, good news, we're not all being killed. You know? <laughs> yeah, but Jesus takes this phrase, euangelion, which is a very common word, good news. And, and, and uses it here. Repent and believe the good news. The reason I say this is because so often we hear these things and go, oh, but if you were back in the time, we would have been like, hey, come on, we're going to the Super Bowl. And there we go, oh, we just click into all this stuff. You know, Evangelion had some of that same idea, you know, with them. We're going to be okay, you know, we're going to be okay. Repent and believe the good news. Uh, so, turn to your neighbor. If over coffee, one of your high school kids, maybe you've just been placed in a high school ministry or young life or something, or youth of Christ, uh, were to ask you, what is the gospel? What is the good news? Uh, what would you say? You have about uh, a minute and a half just to share with each other. Ready, go. What is the good news? <laughs>
uh, discuss this. What is the good news? We have one other announcement because uh, some of you signed up late, so we're making a couple of switches. Go ahead. Okay. Eva, you're going to be with Tegan now and Logan. Yeah. You're going to be with Tanner. Okay, okay cool. Okay. <laughs> that's that's going to because you have an all guys. All boys. Ooh. Let's go. Logan, you got an all guys here. Come on. All right. So, 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 so. All right. Is that good? Bully? We good? Okay, here it is. Uh, is this the good news? This does such a beautiful job of expressing the good news. Now, we might say, I don't know about that fire thing. But uh, you have to stop and ask the question, even though we're seeing it. But, but what do you believe honestly about it? Like, do you actually believe the idea? Now, maybe you wouldn't want fire. That's too much. But do you believe that that's kind of the story, that the good news is you're a sinner. God is holy. You're going to hell. God kind of wants to love you, but he can't. He has to kill you. Jesus says, don't kill him. I will die for them. And then Jesus can love you. Is that the good news? So you can, what? Go to heaven. Because if you don't accept that, you will go to hell. So you might not like the music. <laughs> it's not just tender music with fire. Look. <laughs> <laughs> Holy, dude, that's where I might burn. You know, um, but I, I wonder, if, and I always say this. I grew up, as much as I didn't like this, with this as the message, even though I would try to make it sound a little nicer. I wouldn't have fire. Um, I grew up with, uh, I mean, we took the Bible and we put it into, uh, my generation, put it into four laws. Or we took the whole Bible and somebody came to, I was at the fair last year, and there was a little um, Jesus people there, and they handed me this tract and said, hey, you need to know this. And it says, what uh, you miss by being a Christian. This is what they handed me at the Spokane Fair. What you miss by being a Christian. Hell. Uh, and this is what they were giving to people, the good news. 
So I, I get it. What is your, I grew up with this. I grew up with, I think it was what I call a six, a six line gospel message. Here's the six lines. Make sure you write some of this down, please. Because uh, you, you seem to contemplate this in your, in your world. Uh, there was this thing called the Garden of Eden. It was perfect. But then the humankind fell and ruined it. So one, perfect. Two, the fall, they ruined it. Then three was we live in condemnation, separate from God, because God can't love us because we're sinful, uh, can't be around us. So we live in condemnation. And, but the cross came, Jesus came and died on a cross. That's the fourth. So that I can go to heaven, which is the fifth. Or if I don't accept the cross, I go to hell, which is the sixth. That was the good news that I grew up with. And I want to say this. I came to Jesus growing up with that good news. Um, and here, here's what I'm going to say. We're, 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 I'm going to kind of blow some of this up for you tonight. And I, I also want to say this. I believe this is part of the message of the good news. But I don't believe that's the good news. I think it's a part of it. Um, and I, I came to know the Lord, that story. I came to know the Lord in, in something like this because I was freaking afraid. I prayed every night, you know, that I wouldn't go to hell. Um, and I, I'm so grateful that God, the Holy Spirit, works, I believe, through all of our feeble attempts to explain it. I'm so glad that God is bigger than that. I mean, I believe that the Holy Spirit works even through this dang pamphlet, which I want to light on fire. I want to burn it up, because I, I don't like this presentation of the good news. But I, so I believe the Holy Spirit works, but I believe there's more beautiful ways and more holistic ways to speak about. And I don't think that's, when Jesus came, the kingdom of God is there, repent and believe the good news. I don't think he had this in mind. Well, first of all, Jesus is saying, repent and believe the good news, and Jesus hadn't even died on a cross yet. So if the good news is only about a cross, that gets you a cross, a fiery whatever, Jesus hadn't even died on a cross yet, and he was talking about good news. So you just got to theologically go, oh, okay. What did Jesus mean by this message? There are moments in history where I think we need some new wineskins. Uh, the old story just doesn't work anymore. Believe me, I don't think your generation is being sold by this anymore. My generation created this. I came to know the Lord by something like this. And I thank God, but it, it did some damage to me too, because guilt and fear... Uh, well, it's apparent we know this. If you want your, if you want obedience, use guilt and fear with your kids. It's awesome. They will obey until they walk out of your house, and then guilt and fear come back to bite you, and they, they walk away from all, all of that. Right. So, what is this good news? There are times when we need times we need some new wineskins. Um, we live in what uh, is called right now a post-Christian society. Anybody know what I mean by that? Post-Christian society. I'll just say this. My grandparents grew up in a, in a worldview in America that just kind of, the Bible and God were just kind of a given. It was sort of just the underlaying of everything that was happening. My parents kind of followed up with that a little bit. But your generation, they're saying, is the first generation that is growing up was just like, there's no bottom line, uh, 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 no, no plumb line that the Bible is true, no idea that it would be a part of anything. In, in fact, the fastest growing religion in America right now in your generation, fastest growing, is nuns. Not N-U-N-S, <laughs> but N-O-N-E-S, nuns. What do you believe in? <laughs> yeah. Nuns, it's awesome. They, they dress so cool, it's awesome. No, no, it's nuns that I'm nothing. That's the society that we're going not a, not a Christian society, but a nun. There's nothing. Religion is nothing. I don't believe in anything like that. You're the first generation. We call it a post-Christian society. Um, it's kind of like you're not born with a pre-Christian disposition. You know what I mean? That your grandparents believe this, your parents believe this. You kind of go, oh yeah, I just believe, kind of believe this. Uh, the, co the College Transition Project, uh, they've written a book called Sticky Faith. It is the hottest thing in youth ministry right now because in this, in this study down at Fuller Youth Institute, down at Fuller Seminary down in California, 
Uh, here's what they figured out out of this study. And we've known this for the last uh, probably 15 years, but no one knew it the past. That 50% uh, of kids who uh, say they love Jesus in their youth group, they did studies on youth group kids, 50% of those kids will walk away from their faith after their first year of college. And some of you know some people, your friends, and some of you might in this room be close to that yourself, actually, um, that when you get to college, you walk away from your faith. Um, so th this was the big study. Um, and it's, I'm teaching a youth ministry class right now, and it's rocking our world in youth ministry, saying, well, all our youth work, if 50% of those kids walk away a year from now or whatever and into college, what are we doing? What are we building? Because it, it, it's not lasting. Um, so, in a post-Christian society, what we discover is, you can come and talk about, like, the Jesus, you know, the, the cross, but in a post-Christian society, Jesus just doesn't fit anywhere. Like, if, if I just come in and start speaking about Jesus, and you go to camp and you hear Jesus, and you hear all these cool stories, all you can do is, is get to go, wow, he was cool, he's like a superhero. And then, oh, I'm sin sinful, and maybe by night five you're kind of tired, and then there's this cry night where this formula comes up and, and maybe you go okay well Jesus comes in and I guess he saves us because I'm a loser and God is holy and then I sect him into my heart which is a phrase that's not even a biblical phrase I, I mean I get the idea but it's not like a phrase, it's, there's not a verse you know or anything, I sect him into my heart and then uh, I get to go to heaven and so everybody s says yes or stands up on night <coughs> six at camp and gets saved uh but a year later, they walk away. And here's one of the reasons I think they walk away. Because I think this generation, well, I got saved, now what? I, I got life insurance. I got, I got hell insurance. Okay, uh, I got to go to heaven. Oh, uh, this is boring. No, I, I got the formula now. Okay, I didn't know what now what? So we need, you know, here, here's the idea. Uh, I don't know if you've seen The, the Rise of Skywalker. Anybody Star Wars fans here? I don't know. I'm not a big Star Wars fan, although I did see the first one in 1977, premiere in Portland, with my girlfriend Amy. Oh yeah, I forgot that. Yeah. Um, anyway, um, but here's my theory. I, uh, do you like Rogue One or do you like uh, which one? Which one do you like better? Rogue One. Rogue One. So here's my Rogue One. I'm not thinking for me personally. Uh, a, a little bit like sometimes the way we present the gospel is a little bit, bit like. If you just went and saw Rogue One, or even uh, The Rise of Skywalker, without knowing anything else of the other movies, it might not be your favorite movie. I mean, unless you know the rest of the stories and all the things that build up to it, I wouldn't put it up there with like the Shawshank Redemption, or Forrest Gump, or Saving Private Ryan, or a new movie out right now called Just Mercy. I wouldn't put Rogue One up at that caliber of a movie. It would just sit there to me if I hadn't seen all of the other movies, and just kind of sit there, it might move me, but it wouldn't move me like some other things. I think this generation, when we present Jesus as this formula to figure out, you're a sinner, Jesus bridges this bridge gap, this thing, so you can go to heaven. Um, it's, like, it's like seeing Rogue One without knowing the rest of the story. It becomes this formula. This thing, and I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm not saying Jesus didn't save you. I'm not saying Jesus didn't die. I'm not saying Jesus doesn't forgive your sins. I'm just saying that's not a big enough story to hold you in through your first year of college when you go, okay, now what? Now what? And I'm not sure that's what Jesus meant in his first sermon in Mark chapter 1, repent and believe the good news. New book came out. They did another study. What has kept kids? Now, we know 50% walked away, but what about the other 50%? Why did those kids out of high school and youth groups and young life not walk away? What kept them in the faith? Maybe that would be for even some of you here. What kept them in the faith? So they studied this, and they came out. Uh, what they discovered is that these churches that these kids were in that hung on to their faith through college made three key shifts in how they speak about the central message of the good news. In other words, they didn't do this. They didn't put Jesus into a formula. They just studied this and realized, here's what, and here's what they discovered. 
Shift number one. Students who hung onto the faith, their church somehow had less talk about abstract beliefs and behaviors and more talk about the person of Jesus and what he actually said and did. They actually spent a lot of time looking at the life of Jesus in the Gospels. Now, I, I, I'm just telling you what they discovered, okay? Number two, shift two, churches uh, went deep. They weren't just up here, oh, be nice. They actually went theologically deep. Don't truncate the gospel into formulas and facts. Rather, focus on the redemptive narrative of the Bible. Use story language to describe God's work in the world. In other words, they move from formulas and proof texting and verses to really think, what, what is, I mean, here's the deal. We have a whole freaking Bible. Why do we need that whole Bible if, we, if this is the good news? Just give it, and why didn't God just put a special golden page in with this in it? Because why do we need the whole Bible if the good news is just this? Jesus died so you can go to heaven. Well, let's just get to the point. Why do we need the rest of the Bible? So we have to wrestle with this. Shift three. Talk less about heaven later and more about life here. The churches they looked at talk a lot less about, oh, going to heaven someday, which, by the way, I think it's important for me to go when we die, and I, I'm hoping for heaven. But the churches just talk less about that and more about life here. And if I were to summarize what that study, Growing Young, talked about, is this. If I just put it, talk about Jesus, there's a bigger story, and talk about life here. Not about, hey, here's a formula. If you pray now, you get to go to heaven someday. Because you certainly don't want to burn in hell. Now, I certainly don't want to burn in hell, but um, I'm just saying what they discussed. Uh, tonight, I, I want to talk just a little bit about uh, the, the, the first two of these, Jesus and the bigger story. I'm just going to talk about those two tonight, of these shifts, okay? Um, because I want to say this. Jesus is a part of a bigger story. Because here's, here's, the, here's the big question. What is the story we're telling? What is the story, if you're a Christian or a follower of Jesus, that you're telling? Because where we start the story and where we end the story determines the story that we're actually telling. So let's start in the beginning. And this is part of this is some a little review from what we did a little bit last semester for some of you. Um, Jesus is part of your story. I love this. The very to me, the first Genesis, the first chapters are the, the most important part of the whole Bible. And, and so I think we need to start in the beginning. Mostly we just start like this. Most people start with uh, you're a sinner, and Jesus died for your sin. I think we need to start at the beginning of the story. Because where you start the story determines where you're going to end the story. So, here's what it says. In the beginning, this is the very first words in the Bible. God created the heavens and the earth. And now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. The Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And I'll put slash chaos. I'll talk about it in a minute. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. It was good. I mean, we read this again, he created this, he created this, he created this, he created this, and it was good, and it was good, it was tov. The word in Hebrew is tov. And the best way I can describe the word tov is, I, I, like, I like the word in tune. It's, it's, it's the best way I can describe it. It is so in tune, it was so mm, in tune. So harmonious. And this is God's spirit was hovering over the waters. Now, I'm just gonna say this again. <clears throat> the first chapters of Genesis are in the form of a poem in Hebrew. It's a chiastic Hebrew poem. And in Hebrew and in the Bible, de depending on the actual context, the, the waters always represented chaos. You gotta understand first world like people, like early civilization, like the sea, the waters, that was the most scary, chaotic place ever. To get on a boat and go out was the most scary, because you didn't have diving masks or anything. I mean, can you imagine as a primitive person looking at, 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 out of the water and all of a sudden you see like a humpback whale going, you go, oh my God. 
you have no clue what's under there. And it, so they call it the deeps. And, and so in Hebrew, in this poem, they, it really, literally, the spirit was not like, we can say it's hovering over the water, but it was really hovering over the chaos of things. And, and, and I will say this, we see this even in scripture. Like Job says, who alone stretches out the heavens and tramples down the waves of the sea? I mean, Job is living a very chaotic life. You read the story of Job. And he says, yeah, who tramples down the waves of the, of, of the chaos? It's God. You know, not, not the ocean, but I mean, it's, it's deeper than the ocean. Job is talking about his, the chaos of his life. Or in Psalm 77, 16, the waters saw you, O God, and the waters saw you, and they were in anguish. The deeps trembled. I mean, again, this is where evil lies. This is the, where the, the, the Leviathan is. This is where, where it, it, I mean, and what he's saying is that, that the evil and the chaos of the world just trembles at you. I mean, the water representing something so scary. For, for, I mean, really, for, 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 for world people. Uh, Psalm 74, 13 and 14. You divided the waters by your might. You broke the heads of the sea monsters in the waters. I mean, they they don't thought they were monsters. They were probably whales. But they were, and, and you crushed the heads of the Leviathan. These dragons that thought were under the water. Again, the water represented just crazy scale of chaos of life. And uh, let me ask this question. Um, what's your name again? Paige. No. Oh, Paige. Wow. <laughs> Yay. Um, what? Uh, before God created, what was the world like? Yeah, there's, anybody else want to add to this? It was chaos. It was crazy. And then God began to speak, right? The spirit was hovering over chaos before he started creating. What was the world like after God created, George? Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Um, this is how I think we mostly understand this story, right? It was crazy, chaotic. God spoke, and it was perfect. Um, actually, it wasn't perfect. Because after God created in this beautiful garden, there was a freaking snake in it. You know, so it wasn't perfect. There was some stuff in it that was causing still some chaos, right? Um, I grew up with this idea, and I think this is what kind of we have grew up with, but our theology department talked, is talking a lot about this, that somehow God created and it was perfect. And then we fell with all this craziness and all this evil, and it's still winding down, getting worse and worse. My, you know, we thought maybe Hitler was the Antichrist. My dad thought certainly it was Obama. Um, you know, he came down you know, I mean, you, you, that some of the Antichrist is coming. It's, the world is winding down this evil, crazy place where, boom, whoever it is, and, and the Christians launch off to heaven, and this place burns and goes away. That's it. Rather, I believe the story is this. It wasn't perfect, but it was good. It was in tune. And God met people, and he said, I want to partner with, with you. And we're going to talk about this. And God is working with us. And there's a fall, there's craziness, but God is drawing all the crazy. He's drawing this thing to a more beautiful picture of who he is. Until finally, heaven comes to earth. We miss Todd being there. So you, you gotta stop. What is your view of the story? Is it this or is it this? I want to propose to you that I think it's this. Now, <coughs> listen to this. Uh, God blesses. In Genesis 22, God blesses the animals. I, I, I've never thought about this. That God blessed them and said, be fruitful and increase in number. He said this to all the animals. And then God goes on and he blesses humans. And he uses the same words that he used for animals. God bless the man and said, be fruitful in number and fill the earth. You know, uh, man, it's just, uh, the word bless is baraka. That's the word in Hebrew. And it literally means this, to adore or to kneel before. And it, it, it gives us this picture that God, the all-powerful God, in his creation, in creating animals and humans, literally went, whoa, whoa, whoa. That is incredible. That is incredible. 
you're, you're created in this image. It, it, it's unbelievable. And humans, even more like, whoa, 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 you know, because we're created in his image, like the most in his image. I mean, it, it would be like John the Baptist when Jesus showed up to be baptized. And John, Jesus simply says, John, I want you to baptize me. And Jesus goes down and almost blesses, I mean, kneels down for John. So I, I can't, wait, wait, you don't, you're God. I, you, I don't baptize you. You baptize me. And Jesus goes, oh, you baptize me. I mean, it's almost that humility you see in God. This incredible picture. Like God, and then, then we see when he created all of it, uh, verse 31, God saw all that he made after he made human beings, and after he made human beings, just say it's tov and tomb. He said, man, it's ma'od tov. It's like stinking good. It's like unbelievably good. It's like so very, very good. I mean, this is where the story starts. And it's in this story, in Genesis 1 and 2, that we discover our purpose as human beings, which is the question every human asks. Where's my purpose? Well, the Bible, Bible answers this for us. We've been created to reflect God. Genesis 1, 26 and 28, God said, let us make humans in our, remember this? This first picture we have of the Trinity. God is this community. In our image, let us make humans in our likeness. So of all of creation, which God blessed and went, whoa, bowed before, he bowed the most before humans, the closest to his image. Then God said we were created to be in right relationship. We talked a little bit about that last semester. We were created to be in a right relationship. You can look at this in Genesis, in Genesis 3, 8, with God. This picture that God just come down and hang with them in the garden. The man and the wife and the son of the Lord walked in the garden. They would just hang out. They were created to be with him. Two, they were created to be in a right relationship with God, created to be right in right relationship with each other. Uh, the idea that God said, it's not, it's not good that you're alone. You need to be in a right relationship with somebody else that's like you. So God created a, a woman. Another human to interact with. It's not right to be alone. It's right related to the other. And they were created to be in right relationship with the earth. And God said, I give you every seed bearing plant of the face of the earth and every tree that has food and seed, and they will yours for food. This idea that there was this symbiotic relationship, that it was just good. There was all this stuff is for you. You can eat the trees and fruit, and, and it, 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 the, the right relationship with everything. It, it, it's, it's this beautiful picture, right? With God, with each other, with the earth. And you get this picture. Secondly, the third, remember, we're created to reflect God. We're created to be in a right relationship. And thirdly, we're created to do God's stuff. Genesis 1.28. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase the earth, fill the earth, and subdue it. Remember we talked about this word subdue? The word is kabash in Hebrew. It's a, Jew, it's a Yiddish Jewish phrase. Look, you put the kabash on that. It means you, you put a stop to it. Literally what God is saying, we use it to, uh, to uh, initialize sort of a manifest destiny and empire. And we colonize the world over this verse. We're subduing the indigenous people here in America. Because they're not taking care of it. We're, 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 gonna, we're gonna take it over because it's our right to do it. We're subduing the earth. That's why we go over to, over to Africa and take over and colonize their land. But the real truth of the, the word is, God says subdue it, which is the word kabash, means you put a stop. Humans, I need you to work with me to put a stop. You put the kibosh on that. On anything that doesn't bring tov. That doesn't bring the goodness. That doesn't bring the in tuneness of what life should be. That, that's why we were created. And, 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 and to work it and care for it. I mean, the Lord, God took the man, put him in the garden to work it and care for it. That word, in an NIV translation of the Bible, that word, take care of it, is a word called avad in Hebrew. It's called avad shema. Avad means to dress or to serve. Shema means to guard or to treasure or to watch. Actually, the King James Version, I think, has a really way cooler way to translate this. For the Lord God took command and put him in the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. By the way, Jonathan Moo, we're so glad he's here because Christians should be the most concerned about the environment. Because God called us to care for this place, 
That's our purpose, to reflect God, to be in a right relationship, and to do God stuff. He want God, it's an amazing thought that God decided to partner with human beings to bring his purposes to this, to this earth. Jesus called it the kingdom of God. Jesus talked more about the kingdom of God. In the Old Testament, he said, hey, I want you to subdue, put the kibosh, I want you to partner with me to bring my purpose. Jesus called it the kingdom of God. Bring the kingdom here. Live out the kingdom of God. That's what Jesus called it. I mean, it's an incredible picture. And we got to name animals. I mean, God's literally saying, hey, here, here's how I want you to be like, you, you're going to name stuff for me. And our job here is to name stuff for God. To walk into places broken and say, I'm naming God here. I'm bringing goodness here. We're going to change. This is the way it should be. That's our job as Christians. It's why it feels good when something gets fixed, where love is present, where forgiveness happens, because we were created to do that stuff, to do God's stuff. That's our purpose. And it closes, this whole section of Scripture closes in creation with this phrase. The man and the woman were both naked and they felt no shame. I shared it with you last semester. We cannot even imagine what it would be like to not feel shame. Because this isn't about, ooh, you're nude or something. You know, this, the, what the Hebrew rabbis were to say, no, what God is saying to us here, there was human, human, unfiltered love. There was no comparison. There was no, hey, why are you looking at me that way? There was this perfect in tuneness between people. We can't imagine that because most of our relationships are so not in tune. Look at your family. Look at what's going on, even maybe what's preoccupied in your mind right now. It's about broken relationships that aren't in tune. Jesus called this the kingdom of God. And what I want to say to this, we talk a lot about original sin. But theologians now are beginning to go, wait a minute, we need to talk more about original blessing. Because the start of the story is about an original blessing. Most of us want to start the story. Remember I said this, where you start the story, and where you end the story, determines the story you're telling. Most, I grew up, and I start the story with the fall. You're a sinner. I forgot about the original blessing. Isn't that beautiful? Just to stop and read that and go, oh, that's kind of, that's kind of wild. Yeah, we've sinned. And, and we even had, we had to leave the garden. But God doesn't just stand there with his arms folded. I mean, this is, last year I just realized, and when I was talking with Adam Nieder about this, and just realizing, whoa, this is, I never saw this. Like, did you ever see Genesis chapter 3, 21? After they sin, and God goes, hey, okay, man, the serpent, what in the heck? Okay, we have to leave. Um, I had this, in our church, this picture, where God is going like this. Get out of here, you sinners! You know, and they're leaving. But I never saw this, this verse, Genesis 3, 21. The Lord God, you know, because it says later that they were naked and they were ashamed. And they were covering up because they, they listened to the snake. And God said, hey, did you listen to the snake? Did you pick the, you know? And, and, and so I uh, had these leaves. And here God goes, you know, you're going to have to leave. But here's the deal. Um, here's some uh, new clothes. It's like God cares for this. Here's some new clothes. Put these on. And uh, he makes his clothes to cover our shame. Maybe, I think God is saying, like, I know the shame of this world and the look, what's going to happen. I mean, this is all beautiful poetic imagery that you're going to compare and contrast and go, oh, don't look at me. So I will help you. I'll cover your shame, and it'll just be a little easier. Because I know it's hard now. And then here's the truth of it. The Lord, I, the enemy says, the Lord God banished them from the garden. But... The uh, New American Standard and the King James say this, say this. Um, and God sent them forth from the garden. Which is it? Sent forth is a little kind of oh. And here's the truth. I think God sent them forth and said, life's going to be different now. Here's some clothes. You gotta go. And here's the good news. And God went with them. That's the story of the Old Testament. He hung out with them. He dwelt with his people in the temple, in the fire, in the cloud. He showed up. He was with them. Where you start the story 
where you end, end the story determines the story you are telling. This is the story that we've been created to live. This is what all humanity longs for. Because from the very beginning, this was our purpose. And we know what it's like. We've all had to leave the garden. But inside of us is a sense that there's this original blessing. This is rumbling around, covered by sin and all kinds of stuff. It's why uh, we have this ministry. Uh, some of you um, are serving. Is anybody here serving in Capernaum? I think, uh, yeah, you're, you're Tori, you're serving in with Capernaum. And uh, we often have some of our students, youth groups, at the First Press youth group has come, and uh, they were, they've helped serve uh, in Capernaum just to help out with, with these students with special, with special needs. And many times I'll see high school kids start to cry. And I ask, why, why are you crying? What, what is bringing this emotion? And it's because they tap in hanging out with these kids with special needs uh, into, into their purpose. What they were created for, to bring the kingdom. And there's something about the kingdom that happens when you're around these kids. And it, it, it forces this beauty out of the, that's a piece of the kingdom. Everything we love has its roots in Genesis 1. Sunsets, relationships. Everything we love has its roots in Genesis 1 and 2. Uh, nature, art, poetry, caring for cute little puppies. Care, God said, care for it and keep this place. Lakes, mountains. Jesus did not show up about three quarters of the way through the Bible and start Christianity. Turn to your neighbor. Was Jesus a Christian? Turn to your neighbor. Christians, people of the way. Christianity was religion that people put together trying to figure out how to take Jesus' stuff and the Bible and make sense out of it and structure it. And we call that today Christianity. Jesus did not come down here to start Christianity. Jesus came down here to love us, to forgive us, and look, write this down. Jesus came down here to love us, and to forgive us, and to remind us, and to remind us of the story we were created to live in. A story that rings true at every, uh, at the very heart of every person. A story that brings sense to why we wonder about God, because we were created in His image. That's why we wonder about Him. You know, cows don't wonder about God, but somehow God created us with the ability to make meaning out of symbol, and in His image, we think about God. Jesus brings, it's, it's why this story brings sense to why relationships are so important. Because we were created out of the, the relational God. I mean, I call God the ultimate relationship. Let us make humans in our image. So our relationships are, and why we're not supposed to be alone. I mean, this story rings true at the very heart of every person. It's, it's why the earth and the outdoors are so important for most of us. And why nature speaks so loudly to us about God. Because we were created to care and love for this place. Like, dang it, we should be most concerned about global warming. Because I don't believe that God just put trees and little ferns and grass and nice little smells and flowers here as little funny little, little beautiful little accoutrements uh, that we can have until our ephemeral spirits fly off to heaven someday. I think God cared for the whole thing, animals and all. He blessed them. Not just 
has a little waiting time. That's why people want to serve, and they feel good about serving, because we were created to care. We were created to do God's stuff. And Jesus is a part of that story. And this is what we all groan for. I mean, Jesus came down and said, hey, wait a minute. Bring the kingdom. Love your neighbor. We've got to be in tune here. We can't hate people. It goes all the way back to Genesis. Be in right relation. Reflect my image. Do God's stuff. Jesus said, okay, well, bring the kingdom. This God kingdom that you were created from the beginning to live in. Bring that. That's what Jesus came down to do. And it's what the whole world groans for. I mean, this is Romans 8, 22 to 23. I love this verse. And Paul is getting that. Here's what he says. We know, check this out, before you go, oh, Kip thinks there's going to be dogs in heaven. Uh, I actually do. <laughs> before you just throw it out and go, that's crazy. And maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm going to have a lot. And, and I'll go, where are the freaking dogs that Jesus and I have? They, they didn't have soul. We, they were just little furry things for a while. Oh. But, no, I, I hope not. I really hope not. And here's my hope. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childhood. Right at the present time, not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoptions as sons, the redemption of our bodies. I mean, God is talking not just about our bodies, but about all of creation is groaning to find in tuneness again. Original sin or original blessing? Well, I, I do think we sin. But I don't, I don't like the word original sin because the, the, the original part was an original blessing. Now, sin happens, but the original part was an original blessing. We've all sinned, no doubt. But I'm just saying I don't think that's what's most true about you. I think sin covers the story, Lindsay, that you are meant to live in. I think when God looks at you, he doesn't just look at you, uh, Matt Matson, and say, God, you're a sinner. God sees this person within you that he created that can be a blessing. He sees what you can be. He's hurt by the way that sin has caused you not to live out the in you're supposed to live out. But God is on the original sin. God looks at it and goes, oh, man, if you only knew what I had envisioned for you to be. Now, sin has done some damage. But the original thing is not original sin. The original thing is you're a blessing. You're created to do stuff. Inside of all that that's been covered by sin is this unbelievable person in my image. That's the original. The story starts in Genesis 1 and 3. I actually, this is my little thing, I think most people start the story in Genesis 3 with the fall. And let me say this, where you start the story, where you end the story. If you start the story and end the story with start with the fall and end with the cross, that's it. That's your story. But if you start with original blessing and end with revelations, maybe you have a little different story. Maybe we've forgotten the beginning. And the story has morphed into this idea that the goal of the Christian life is simply to get saved. I'm not saying we shouldn't get saved. I got saved. But the goal of Christian life is, is simply just to get saved. And then hang on for dear life in this crazy God-forsaken earth because someday we get to launch off to heaven and leave this hellhole. No, no, no. Forgetting that heaven actually ends here. The clearest picture of heaven we have is Revelation 21. There it is. And then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. Like I used to go, oh, in heaven there's no sea? I need water. I need to go surfing. I, are you telling me there's no sea? No, again, understand the poetry of this. Sea equals, like, there's no more chaos. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, newly dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place 
is now among the people, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, we know where death, mourning, crying, pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He will see them throne. says, I am making everything new. And the word, uh, or all things new, the word all in Greek is pas, P-A-S, all. You know what it means? It means every freaking thing. Like trees. Everything. I'm making it all new. So, I believe this, that the clearest picture, picture of heaven is that picture is this picture of heaven being here. Behold, I'm making all things new. The church, I'll be careful here, but I'm just going to say this. The church seems really concerned about getting you all there. I think Jesus was really concerned about getting there. I'm not saying that there isn't important, but if you look at the message of Jesus, he was much more concerned that we bring that kingdom here. So maybe we should start bringing the kingdom and doing God stuff now. That's what we were created for. That's what Jesus called us to do. The good news is the story of a God who should have given up on us. This is the story of the Bible. He should have given up on us, but he stuck with us. He gave us clothes. Walked out of the garden with us. He stuck with us to the last book of the Old Testament, which is that great Italian prophet, Malachi. Or Malachi, as we call it. Uh, when the prophet Malachi penned his final desperate plea at the end of his book, here's what his plea was. Please, people, live back into the story of God. Don't forget the story we're supposed to live in, to, to bless and, and not be bigoted and help hate people. Please live into the story of God. When God should have lost his patience, he stuck with them to the very end. And he did something preposterous. He never lost his patience, but he sent a baby. He said, I, I'm going to show you what I mean. The story you're supposed to live in. The good news is not that, you're just, that we're saved from but also, the good news is what Jesus saves us for. If you were to write down anything, this is it. The good news is not just what Jesus saves us from. And he does save us from stuff. Like our sin. But it's also what Jesus saves us for. And I'll just close with this. And you're going to talk about this in your small group. And maybe this generation needs to understand the four in order to better understand what they were saved for. Our job as Christian leaders is this. Our job as Christian leaders is this, to help people see that their story is not enough, that they are a part of a much bigger story, that in the chaos of their life, God's spirit is hovering. Your job as a Christian leader is to help people see that they were created to put the kibosh, to put the stop on anything that doesn't bring you. And that God created them to reflect him, to be in right relationship, and to do God's stuff. Your job as a Christian leader is to help people understand that there's this God who covers their shame and walks out of the garden with them into the chaos of the world. Gives them some clothes. See, that's how carry me is. A God who can see through your original sin and calls them to live into their, their true original blessing. A God who wants to partner with them to take care of this place right here, right now, not just go to heaven someday. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. Let me pray. Lord, that your son was a part of that big story. 
and that people understood what they were saved for. It might help them to understand what they're saved from. I actually think this generation needs to hear that. What they're saved from first. I mean, what they're saved for first. So Lord, be with us as we discuss this. In your name. All right, off small groups. Uh, no, but she will, she will tell you.